Hi, I'm Mike Woodman, an application scientist at Agilent specializing in LC instrument performance. And this is Bill Long, a senior application scientist in the Chemistries and Supplies Division. We're both chromatographers who have been working with HPLC applications for many years. Bill comes at problems from the columns perspective, and I'm more focused on the instrument performance. But of course, we have to know our way around issues from every angle to be effective. Very true. In this section, we're dealing with peak broadening, which is one of the more common problems people call us about. Peak broadening can be caused by a lot of very different issues. Mostly instrumentation issues. I was just going to say mostly columns issues. Actually, many of the issues that cause peak broadening have more to do with the art of chromatography rather than the instrument or the column. Things like improper fittings, mobile phase issues, and system settings. And there are some specific instrument and column issues too, which we'll discuss. But first, to show you what we're talking about, on screen, we're showing you a chromatogram of a test mix containing naphthalene. As you see, our peaks are broadening in the second chromatogram here. So, let's say you're looking at this data. How do we resolve this? For starters, let's talk about good connections. Our tech support team told us the top problem they see occurring that causes peak broadening is improper connections. Problems with connections are often mistaken for column issues. We recommend that you use swage lock fittings or preferably finger tight fittings because they're easier to use. Different manufacturers may have different types of fittings that they use. Here are some examples of stainless steel and polymer fittings as well as the recommendations for their use. The various fittings that you can buy all look pretty similar. Here's another chart which shows you the range of different fittings that you may be using depending on your provider. We'll put these in the downloadable notes for reference. Here's how I make a fitting. First, I choose a screw that's long enough for the fitting that it will be used in. Notice in the diagram that the thread length of the Valco and the water screws, for example, are a bit longer. I use a longer Agilent screw with my Agilent instruments when I know that there's a possibility that I will need to use a component or a column from one of those vendors. The ferrule setback is critical to minimize dispersion and prevent damage to the column and fittings. So an ideal case is to prepare a new fitting in the device that will be using it. So to make the fitting, we'll slide the screw over the end of the tubing, carefully slide the ferrule component on after it, and then finger tighten the assembly. Then use a wrench to gently tighten the fitting, which forces the ferrule to crimp onto the tubing. Don't over tighten it though, because that will shorten the useful life of the fitting. Many people have a tendency to over tighten, which leads to a leaking fitting or even damage. Once you believe you have completed the fitting, I think it's a good idea to loose the fitting and then inspect it to make sure that the ferrule has the correct position on the tubing. Another way to pre-assemble a fitting that can be adapted to most of the designs discussed is to stake the ferrule onto the tubing using a longer tube extension fitting. When gently tightened, the ferrule will stay on the tubing, but will slide down into a perfect zero dead volume connection if it is then moved to a shorter extension fitting. You generally cannot slide the ferrule up the tubing though, so once modified, you're pretty much stuck with it in that new position. I simply use the TCC oven, which has a zero dead volume. It's nice and heavy, and it doesn't move, and it gives you a free hand to be able to push the tubing while holding the fitting. The important thing to note is that you want the tubing to be in the ferrule just before the tip. In this case, setting the ferrule improperly can lead to problems. In the first diagram, you can see the tubing is too long the ferrule will not be able to seat properly and leaks will occur. In the example we're showing now, the tubing is not in far enough. In the void space, a mixing chamber or dead volume will occur, resulting in poor peak shape. 
If you have been using different manufacturers' columns, make sure you're using the correct fitting to avoid creating mixing chambers or issues with ferrule seating. Okay, that's all you need to know about fittings. Seems easy enough, but it's a problem area for a lot of people. Now, let's switch gears and talk about your instrument setup. The way your instrument is installed can affect your chromatography, as can the tubing you use. Many people are not aware of this. It is important to know that all your components are safely stacked. We have a great new LC rack you can purchase to help ensure the best stacking of your system. We like these racks because it makes it easy to switch out modules. It's part number 5001-3726. In addition, tubing volume is something you want to keep an eye on, particularly as you adjust your methods. The amount of extra tubing you have on your instrument will be more and more important as you work with more efficient columns and columns of smaller dimensions. On screen, we're showing a diagram that we'll include in our notes to highlight the recommended stacking of the 1260 Infinity, in this case equipped with low dispersion volume capillaries. And here's another that details how to optimize your instrument if you're using a mass spectrometer. The key here is to reduce the amount of tubing that you're using to make connections. Look over here. Chromatographers who are using older USP methods may be using this type of a setup. In this case, the extra tubing volume is not going to be a big deal because it doesn't exceed the column volume, which is quite large. But if this person wants to adjust their method to a shorter, more efficient column, such as a poor shell 120 column, this excess tubing volume will cause very wide peaks to occur. So here's the type of tubing arrangement you'd want to see on a smaller column. See how these connections are very short? And we're even using a narrower red 0.12 millimeter tubing. We're also going to include a useful reference table complete with part numbers to help you identify which tubing you need for different connections. This will all be in the downloadable notes or available on our website by searching for peak broadening video notes. Okay, now we've covered some of the issues that can cause peak broadening, but there are more. Yes, the data collection rate is also a common source for peak broadening. You'll want to look at your data collection rate and ensure that it's properly set to optimize your results for the specific column you're using. Here's a series of chromatograms to illustrate what I'm talking about. This particular data was run for an analysis using poor shell 120 columns. We're measuring efficiency, and as you can see, the efficiency increased as the data collection rate went higher. So how do we set up the right data collection rate? We want to optimize our data collection rate in the detector. You optimize data collection rate by adjusting the detector setting and or the time constant to the fastest possible value that does not compromise signal to noise. The peak width control in ChemStation enables you to select the peak width or response time for your analysis. The peak width, as defined in ChemStation software, is the width of the peak at half height. Set the peak width to the narrowest expected peak in your sample. You should not use a faster response time than you need since this may cause greater noise in the baseline. Another setting to watch if you're seeing peak broadening is your flow rate, or more correctly, linear velocity. Each column particle size has an optimal linear velocity, which needs to be determined experimentally. Let's talk now about injections. I cover a lot more about this topic in a separate segment, but for now, let's just make the point that scaling the injection volume of your sample is important to your chromatographic results. If you have your injection volume too high, this can overload the column, which will lead to peak broadening, as this series of chromatograms shows. Here, we see our run using 1, 2, 5, and 10 microliter injections. And you see how the peaks broaden as the injection volume is increased. In addition, the injection diluent strength has implications for peak shape and can be a source of significant peak broadening. Yes, it can. See, in this example, we have evidence of band broadening due to the strong diluents at 5 microliters on this small column operated in a low dispersion system configuration. But with 10 microliters, the loss of peak symmetry is clearly a problem. This ultimately limits sensitivity unless an evaporation step is made to concentrate the analytes to support a smaller injection volume. 10 microliters seems small 
if you've been using conventional 4.6 millimeter long columns, but as we move into more solvent conservation and mass spec applications, the average column is much smaller and the injection volume needs to be proportional to the column volume. So far, we've only been dealing with peak broadening from the perspective of isocratic methods. If you're running a gradient method, you'll find that you generally won't have as many peak broadening issues because gradients generally reduce band broadening. However, if you don't have your gradient properly designed, you may see some peak broadening at the start of your run when you're actually in the inherent isocratic hold at the beginning of the run. This is because of the gradient delay volume. Here's an example to show how this might look. The way you want to address this is to reduce the initial gradient composition so the peaks do focus on the column. Or you could use injector programming to start the gradient sometime before the sample injection is made. That's one of the easier fixes. Yes, Bill. It's nice when we can just make a few changes on ChemStation and take care of things. So let's summarize what we've covered. If you're seeing peak broadening, start by looking at your fittings. Make sure they're made correctly. Don't forget the fundamental stuff. Is your LC plumbed correctly? Has someone modified it recently? Make sure your data collection rate and flow rates are optimized for your column. And that you are scaling the injection volume so you don't overload your column. And be sure your tubing volumes are minimized. That's another very key area to watch. And for gradients, check your programming to ensure you're accounting for your system dwell volume if you're seeing wider peaks at the start of your run. At this point, you've likely covered 90% of what the source of your peak broadening could be. If you're still having an issue, consider visually inspecting all of the fittings and tubings from the injector to the detector. Try a new column of the same dimensions and type too, because columns really do not last forever. A partially blocked column frit, which might also show unusually high operating pressure, will often cause distorted peak shapes. And, as always, contact Agilent Technical Support with any questions. You can find the right contact information for your location on Agilent.com.